All right. Good morning. It is uh, September 3rd, 2021, and this is the uh, OSU Turfgrass Team Times online. Today, we got Dr. David Gardner and uh, Dr. Dave Shetler, who I'm um, surprised it does not have fall, uh, fall army worms coming out of his two ears. Um, <laughs> but he is going to talk about the continuing damage that is uh, being wreaked by these insects. Uh, but first up, Dr. Garner is going to talk to us uh, a little bit about the weed problems we're starting to see, and also, I believe, some seeding. Dr. Gardner. All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, when it comes to uh, weed control, you know, one of the things that I do out here is I test herbicides, and I wanted to test herbicides on uh, sedges, and uh, even in the middle of July, there was no sedge population, and I was starting to get kind of concerned, and that's not a problem anymore, right? Uh, yellow nut sedge is everywhere. It just emerged a little bit later this year, but it is uh, um, quite active in uh, lawns and other turf surfaces now. Uh, when it comes to the herbicides that you can use, uh, really um, any of the uh, products here um, will do the job. Halosulfuron, sulfentrazone, amazosulfuron, and pyrimisulfan are systemic, and so you have a better chance of getting longer-term control. But even with that, the whole idea is that, you know, it's called nuts because it has a corm that persists underground that results in that plant being a perennial. And so getting enough herbicide translocated to that structure to actually kill it permanently usually requires some persistence. So you're going to need you know, more than one application over a period of a year or two in order to get that total control. But all of these products will work fairly rapidly. Now, sulfentrazone will give a uh, burn down within seven days. The others take a little bit longer. Um, the newer product that's on this list is pyrimisulfan, which is Vaxis. That's a granular formulation that's available either in a 35 pound bag for broadcast applications or in a two pound shaker. That's got good soil uptake activity. So you can apply it to, um, dry turf, and then as long as it's watered in within um, the specified time on the label, uh, then you'll get good soil uptake and uh, that product is effective too. So, um, you know, Bassagran's a little bit older material, it's contact, um, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, not going to give you permanent control, but it is, uh, you know, one of the more rapid acting herbicides as well. So there are a lot of options for sedge control on the market. Um, and this is, you know, the time to try to do it. But again, um, even with these, uh, you might not get enough herbicide into uh, the uh, underground structure to get permanent control. Um, so you might want to uh, note where those weeds are so that you can go back next year and monitor to see if any repeat applications will be necessary. If just to, to cut in in front of you there, from a standpoint of if you have a bad problem with it and you take it out, you're going to have a potential barrier. You saw reseeding intervals on these products? Hmm. And oh, you're no, the worst question. Now, according, according to the label, yeah, check the label for the reseeding interval on them. Um, I, I don't have that information offhand. I don't like to memorize things like that because if I say it and then I get it wrong, catastrophe is going to happen. Always look nice, nice sidestep, Dave. There we go. Read the label, folks. That, that is a sidestep and it is quite on purpose. Um, I've always been like that. I, even with rates of products, somebody says, what's the rate? And it's like, look, with the Mesotrion, I know it's three, three times five ounces per acre, but it's like, I don't say stuff like that because again, at some point you're going to say it wrong and it's like, oh, it's five ounces, but I accidentally said 50 or something like that. And then, you know, you're going to get calls, right? So again, check the label on the reseeding interval. Now, on to a completely different matter, winter annuals. Um, if you had a problem with these in the spring and you were dissatisfied with your control of these, well, one thing is that there is a herbicide that's used by the organic uh, industry, uh, chelated iron. It's a contact herbicide, but these are annuals. And so there isn't an underground structure to try to control. And if you have these and you've had trouble controlling them in the springtime with our traditional selective chemistries, try the chelated iron. I found that those uh, actually do a pretty good job of burning these weeds down. But the other thing that you can do is if you had a severe infestation of them and you know where you had that, we're getting pretty close to the time of the year that you'd want to put down a pre-emergence herbicide in order to prevent these from germinating this fall. So these weeds will start to germinate in September and October, persist over winter, and then they're a problem next April. So again, if you had a severe issue with these, um, it's never too early to try to take them out. The bottom line is, is that 
for the control of those generally, a pre-emergent application in September is going to be more effective than a post-emergence application in November, which is going to be better than a post-emergence application in April, which sometimes can be kind of disappointing. Talking a little bit about seeding, this is the month to reestablish turf from seed. Uh, make sure that you're doing all of the proper steps, including a mulch, uh, preferably one of those uh, uh, paper product mulches that are dyed as opposed to using straw or hay. And then make sure that you are irrigating as necessary to keep that upper surface uniformly moist. We're still at a time of the year that probably two times a day is necessary in order to keep the uh, surface uniformly moist, but it's not gonna be much longer before you'll be able to get away with once perhaps in the middle uh, to late afternoon uh, in order to uh, keep the environment conducive to germinating. Um, I tell people if it's Kentucky bluegrass, that takes a little bit longer to germinate and establish. If you want to be sure that you're going to get good establishment to have that grass in the ground by September 15th. The others generally by September 30th now, We've had several years uh, the past uh, decade that uh, you know fall went pretty late and I saw people seeding with some success in the middle and even the end of October. But the problem is, is that depending on the weather and if there's any annual ryegrass in the mix, what can happen is, is that you know that will germinate at a lower temperature. And so you end up accidentally getting a little bit more of an annual ryegrass stand than you do the grasses that you actually want to have, um, you know, populating that stand. So, um, you know, particularly with Kentucky bluegrass, uh, wrap up that seeding effort here in the next couple of weeks. But for the other grasses, if you have it done by September 30th, you should um, be in good shape. Last thing of note is that with crabgrass and other annual grasses, the nights are going to be getting cooler. And so you're going to start seeing crabgrass go brown on its own. And it won't be too much longer before it starts to turn that uh, mahogany or reddish color we're getting close to the end of crabgrass's life cycle. So just about anything that you put on it as far as a herbicide is just going to hasten its going away. But the big thing is, is that like in my front yard right now, I'm kind of lazy. I haven't mowed the lawn recently because the grass hasn't necessarily needed it, but the crabgrass that I have is all, you know, like in full bloom and, you know, like I've got seed head six, seven inches off the ground. Mow to reduce the seed head production so that that makes it easier next year to, uh, you know, keep the uh, population down with your pre-emergent herbicide. But again, in those areas where you have crabgrass and you're not going to control, at least mow to control the seed population and map out for uh, where you're gonna put your pre-emerge down uh, next year. Ed, that's what I have for this week. Thanks, Dave. Always high quality information as usual. Uh, on the disease front this week, early in the week when we were in those, uh, in that period of high temperatures coming off the weekend, uh, and there was some rainfall and humidity. We did see actually some uh, pithy and blight up around the, the Worcester area, but minor and uh, temperatures have, have definitely come back in our favor from the standpoint of some of the bigger, uh, scarier diseases. Now, dollar spot did increase uh, in activity, but we've also dried down in general this week. And so that's kind of limited some of the impact of uh, dollar spot. Um, the one that I would expect to see based on the, the forecast is that, the, and the drying weather is that uh, rust pr probably is going to kick up a little bit stronger on those older perennial ryegrass home lawns in the next uh, seven to 10 days. So um, we're definitely out of frying pan, but we're not quite jumping back into the fire. How's that work for you? Um, <clears throat> a couple other things to remind you of the OTF, uh, Golf outing for scholarships is coming up uh, down in Dayton. That's early October. The ATI scholarship outing is at the end of September, and that's coming up uh, in Columbia Hills up uh, south side of Cleveland. Uh, I think from the standpoint of the turf team, um, we cannot say thank you enough to Dr. Shetler for his expertise in the last week or 10 days. Uh, there's a host of documents online available to you uh, to talk about smushing uh, these uh, army worms. And I think the one thing, if you do have a question about it, is that until there's a first frost, if I'm correct, Dave Shetler, we're probably not going to see uh, a drop off in these problems or at least... Um, not uh, a complete annihilation of them. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. First frost is what we're waiting for. If you're, <laughs> if you're not going to apply anything, and I know that there's homeowners folks uh, who have told me they're on a list and they're like number 25 on the list. And if I'm correct, Dave, you know, there's no product yeah, I'll, to be, I'll, I'll talk no product about to be had. When, I, when I'm doing the, the my presentation. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dave Shetler. 
clean up. Okay. Well, obviously, fall armyworm seems to be the, the insect du jour uh, and probably the, the insect of the year uh, the, this year. It's, it's uh, uh, turf is being damaged everywhere from Iowa to New England uh, and south. So basically, the, the eastern half of North America uh, has been having this fall armyworm uh, outbreak. Uh, Want to remind people, uh, all of the armyworm species are striped. So if you find a, a thick bodied caterpillar in the turf and it's got stripes on it, it will be one of the army worms. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that is people are really going out and digging around a lot and, and, and occasionally they find some cut worms. Uh, cut worms usually have these sort of chevrons on them or, or spots, things like that. Uh, the, the difference between the common army worm, our native species and the fall army worm, the one that migrates in, if you look at the head capsule, uh, the head capsule will have what looks like a, an upside down white Y mark. Uh, and, and the, the native uh, common army worm has a little uh, brown H shaped mark. Uh, remember that, that each army worm lay ma several masses of eggs. Those masses of eggs often range from 300 to 500 eggs per mass. So that's why we have the these incredible outbreaks is that all you need is two or three females laying eggs either on the turf or, or on the, the tree leaves above the turf. Uh, and, and you can have a couple of thousand uh, caterpillars uh, munching away. Uh, I also, it's, it's really funny to me in that uh, a lot of the homeowners often say that my lawn disappeared overnight. Well, the appearance of your lawn disappeared overnight. The reality is, is those caterpillars have probably been there for three weeks. Uh, and, and, but when they're in the, the first three to four larval instars, they're so small that they don't cause any visible damage. Uh, if you're really perceptive, you might see a little bit of thinning of the turf. But when they get into those fifth and sixth instars, they are eating machines. Um, and they, they can eat uh, a patch of grass rather than several leaves of grass per day. Uh, and of course, that's when it uh, occurs. I, uh, this one is, is one to us. Uh, this is a lawn over in, in the Dublin area. The homeowner had gone off on a, on a vacation, came back. And the next morning, I, I think when they were probably having a cup of coffee, looked out the backyard and, and it was gone. Uh, you know, <laughs> that, that was the description. Now, remember that the lawn is not gone. Uh, it's only the grass blades are gone. Um, and so one of the things you, you really have to hurry, if, if you get a call for one of these, you can see the irrigation system is running back here. You really need to get some irrigation on that to keep the crowns uh, cooled down during the heat of the day um, and hydrated so that they can send out new foliage, new leaves to cover the crowns and keep them uh, protected. Uh, this is actually a shot over at our, our Ohio State uh, Turfgrass facility. Uh, out at the side of the, the building, we had some patches of bent grass, and, and the army worms seem to really relish uh, bent grass, but they'll take on almost any of the other grasses. Uh, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, bent grass are, are some of the favorites, but they'll feed on the perennial ryegrasses, the tall fescues, the fine fescues, especially if those don't have any endophytes. When it comes to, to recovery, uh, remember that quick response is really necessary. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried as, as Ed indicated that uh, these lawn care companies are scurrying around, you know, they've got to do their normal production and then they have to do these service calls. And, and so it's, it's uh, very difficult for them to, to get around and get all of these places treated. So far, uh, at least in the term, seen is that the pyrethroid still holding up. Some of my agricultural friends are saying that uh, they're trying to spray some of these out in, in uh, agriculture and, and it's not working uh, all that well for them. Uh, if you spray the army worms with a pyrethroid and they don't die, you might want to think about using uh, an alternate insecticide. A celeprin and, and tetrino are excellent against the, the army worms, and you can use the lowest label rate for a curative control. 
Remember, we like to use a celebrant and Tetrino all the way back in May at the full label rate, and you can get season long uh, caterpillar control. In other words, you can get about three months of effective residual. Golf course superintendents have been doing very commonly on their greens and teas. The lawn care companies haven't been doing that that much. However, I have heard from some of the lawn care technical managers that the lawns that they did treat with a celebrin back in, in May and June for white grip control, they've had no callbacks uh, for the army worms. So, uh, if you're worried about this next year, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know right now, typically we do not get a repeat, uh, both with our common army worm and the fall army worm. It is extremely rare for us to get a second year right after the a year that we've had an outbreak. Uh, and, and, but uh, for those of you that want to take out that insurance, uh, both a Celeprin and Tetrino will give you excellent season long caterpillar control, plus kill your bill bugs and your white grubs. Uh, and, and so you might think about those. For those of you that are looking for organic options, there are several A's of Directin uh, uh, materials that, that are available. Now, be very careful what you purchase in there. Make sure that, that you purchase uh, something like Neem X or Azotin. Uh, most of these do have a, an organic uh, label on them. Uh, and, and the label says contains, let's say, 3 or 4% azadiractin. If it says contains neem oil, and that's the only material that it contains, that is not the active ingredient that you need to have to kill these caterpillars. Again, damaged turf, try to get it to recover. The crowns are not dead, uh, but they could be killed in the heat of, of the sun and drying of the sun. So you might need to, to syringe or lightly irrigate in the heat of the afternoon to cool them down. Fortunately, we're in a cool period right now. Um, and so that's probably not as critical, but it, it certainly uh, will help. I usually just rake some of the, what looks like dead turf back if there are some uh, uh, green stems down there, uh, I can get recovery, but if you rake some of it back and you don't see any green stems, you may need to slip seed those killed areas. Finally, uh, the last thing I wanna remind people is, is that uh, uh, Dr. Rose and, and the pesticide education program are having their urban landscape pest management uh, webinar this uh, next week. Uh, you can still register for that. Uh, if you go to the PestEd, P-E-S-T dot O-S-U dot E-D-U website. All right, that's it. Back to you, Ed. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> and thanks for saving me from cutting you out again and ghosting you. Nicely done. All right, folks. Uh, again, thank you for your time. If you have questions, and uh, most of them are going to be directed towards Dr. Shetler, don't be afraid to email them. Um, I will say that he probably wishes he really did retire about six days ago, but you know, nothing to be like back in the heat of the battle uh, again. Folks, thank you for your time and we will talk to you again next week.